now we are going to discuss surgery questions of aims june 2020 so see the first question a patient presented with breast lump okay on biopsy it came out to be breast cancer and this was er positive tamoxifen was given to the patient tamoxifen was given to the patient tamoxifen increases the risk of okay so before discussing this question in detail let us discuss the important points related to tamoxifen so see first this tamoxifen is approved for primary prophylaxis of breast cancer in high risk women okay first point so prophylaxis primary prophylaxis of breast cancer in high risk women now you can see it reduces the recurrence rate of breast cancer in ipsilateral as well as the contralateral breast and it is associated with reduced risk of cancer in contralateral breast one point question is asked what is the dose of tamoxifen it's 10 mg bd for five years so it's given at least 10 mg bd for five years then there are two questions for hormone therapy in premenopausal patients what is the drug of choice it's tamoxifen and in postmenopausal patients it's the aromatase inhibitors now how it acts so this tamoxifen is potent antagonist this is potent antagonist on breast cancer cells and on blood vessels potent antagonist clear and it is having partial agonistic activity partial agonistic activity on pit bull pit bull means pit means pituitary b means bone u means uterus and l means liver clear so it is having partial agonistic activity on pituitary bone uterus liver we are concerned about what uterus so since there is partial agonistic activity what is the main problem yes especially in post menopausal patients in post menopausal patients because of this partial agonistic activity what happens there is increased risk of endometrial cancer and in post menopausal patients already there is increased risk of endometrial cancer so the main problem of this is there is increased risk of endometrial cancer clear we can give this drug in post menopausal patients for hormone therapy we can but we are not giving why because of because of this particular complication clear so it increases the risk of endometrial cancer so now see the question again tamoxifen increases the risk of breast carcinoma in opposite breast no it reduces the risk second endometrial carcinoma yes risk of cml no ovarian cancer no so correct answer for this question is endometrial carcinoma and that is b now see this question appropriate fnac specimen in case of thyroid contains so generally the adequate fnac specimen should contain at least six follicular cell groups so how many cell groups six follicular cell groups and at least there should be presence of 10 cells in each group clear now see what other book says now see this statement most cytologists consider a satisfactory smear to contain at least six clusters at least six clusters of well preserved cells and each group must be composed of at least 10 cells from separate aspirate clear now see what's written here so most cytologists consider a satisfactory smear to contain at least six clusters of well preserved cells and each group must be composed at least 10 cells from separate aspirate clear so for this question the correct answer is b means appropriate fnac specimen in case of thyroid contains six follicular cell groups containing 10 to 15 cells each now see this question which of the following is least commonly injured nerve during thyroid surgery so asking least common complication least common site least commonly injured is a fashion nowadays you will notice that in neat 
as well as in aims generally one question is asked in similar pattern least common site least commonly injured least common complication so let's rule out question is asked what is the most common complication of what is the most commonly injured nerve in thyroidectomy so most commonly injured nerve is external branch of superior laryngeal nerve so the most commonly injured nerve during thyroidectomy is external branch of superior laryngeal nerve also known as external laryngeal nerve clear be careful it is not the recurrent laryngeal nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve is also injured clear now see the problem generally in thyroid surgeries if we are also operating the lateral side of neck so if the lateral neck surgery is also done along with along with the thyroid surgery then what is the problem this marginal mandibular nerve is also injured and especially in robotic assisted thyroidectomy whenever we are using this oral approach trans oral approach in this case also what happens there is injury of marginal mandibular nerve but this ansa cervicalis is not the injured nerve it's not injured and what is the use whenever recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured especially when we are going to excise the part of recurrent laryngeal nerve when it is involved by malignancy we are using ansa cervicalis for reconstruction of recurrent laryngeal nerve now see the literature now see the complications of thyroidectomy there is hemorrhage because of slippage of ligature especially from superior thyroid artery or there is bleeding from muscular artery sometimes it can lead to tension hematoma and because of that in post operative period patient might be having dyspnea or strider in those cases we have to shift the patient immediately to ot open the sutures ligate the bleeding vessel control the hemostasis and then close the wound after inserting the drain right then there are certain other causes of respiratory obstruction one is tension hematoma second it can be because of laryngeal edema and this is the most common cause of respiratory obstruction especially after thyroidectomy what is the laryngeal edema because of anesthetic intubation third important cause is what bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy but it is not very common so question is asked what is the most commonly injured nerve the most commonly injured nerve during thyroid surgery is external laryngeal other nerves which are injured one is recurrent laryngeal and there might be injury of cervical sympathetic trunk another question is asked about thyroid surgery complication that parathyroid insufficiency occurs on which day second to fifth day so it occurs on seventh second to fifth day it leads to hypocalcemia and what is the cause there is vascular infarction whenever we are going to ligate the inferior thyroid artery away from thyroid and this question is frequently asked thyrotoxic crisis in aims that what is the most common cause of thyrotoxic crisis in hyperthyroid patient is the inadequate preoperative preparation means you didn't make that patient you thyroid and you are performing surgery there is release of thyroid hormones during surgery leading to thyrotoxic crisis this is the basic question after that so you saw that external laryngeal nerve and recurrent laryngeal nerve is commonly injured now see so in this book there is robotic assisted thyroidectomy which is mentioned nicely and what are the approaches for robotic assisted thyroidectomy there is trans axillary approach retro auricular approach and trans oral approach okay so whenever we are using this retro auricular approach specifically in this case what happens there is mouth corner deviation from indirect injury to marginal mandibular nerve clear so generally this marginal mandibular nerve injury is not very common during open surgery but in robotic assisted thyroidectomy it is seen now see here in this book what is mentioned patient who undergo lateral neck surgery in association with thyroid surgery lateral neck surgery in association with thyroid surgery they have additional risk of neurovascular injury which include shoulder weakness because of injury of spinal accessory nerve so cranial nerve 11 tongue weakness because of injury to hypoglossal or injury to cranial nerve 12 and c lower lip 
weakness because of marginal mandibular nerve injury and this question was asked indirectly also in aims that in parotid surgery if a patient is having lower lip weakness yes it is because of injury of it nerve so it is because of marginal mandibular nerve so here answer is clear that obviously it is not the recurrent laryngeal nerve it is not the superior laryngeal nerve it's not the marginal mandibular nerve so generally the answer is ensa cervicalis generally it's not injured so what is the role of ensa cervi cervicalis or what is the relation of this nerve in relation to thyroid surgery so see in thyroid surgery when recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured so this is used as a graft now see what bailey says if recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured during surgery and transected ends are identified they should be reanastomosed one in event that length of nerve is excised due to invasion by malignancy the anastomosis of ensa cervicalis can you see anastomosis of ensa cervicalis may be considered what is the advantage it does not return the mobility of vocal cord but advantage is it is going to maintain the neurological input to the muscles of larynx clear so this is the relation of ensa cervicalis with respect to thyroid surgery so here the correct answer for this question is a that is ensa cervicalis so this is a repeat question it was asked many times mild score and there is another question which is being asked that is peld score so what is the full form of mild score model for end stage liver disease and the component for this mild score is cbi clear mnemonic is cbi c means creatinine creatinine b means bilirubin and i means inr clear the second is peld score and the peld score is pediatric end stage liver disease and what's the mnemonic for pell score the mnemonic is nabia it's nabia clear so n means it's the nutrition nutrition a means age b means bilirubin i means inr and a means albumin clear so be careful albumin is a component of pell score it is not the component of mild score so correct answer for this question is what d it's the albumin pell score and mild score are frequently asked nowadays let's discuss in detail so what is the use of this mild score it is used to assess the severity of chronic liver disease and initially this mild score was developed to predict death within 3 months of surgery for the patients who had undergone tips clear so the components are cbi creatinine bilirubin and inr and see by you knows united network for organ sharing it is used for organ allocation in liver transplant recipients and it is 6 to 40 point scale 6 to 40 point scale mild score now see the peld so we discussed the mnemonic is nabia that is nutrition age bilirubin inr and albumin so these are the two questions which are frequently asked and it is very easy to remember mild score by cbi and peld score by nabia now see this question in a patient with recurrent abdominal pain recurrent abdominal pain ultrasound was done and it's normal clear further evaluation by other investigations he was found to have biliary dyskinesia so one problem this patient is having biliary dyskinesia and what is written in the question that ultrasound is normal ultrasound is normal clear so which of the following is not done for the diagnosis of biliary dyskinesia so you can solve this question by common sense also so if ultrasound is normal in this condition if ultrasound is normal in this condition obviously ultrasound cannot be used for the diagnosis so what generally it is not diagnosed by ultrasound so this is based on common sense by the way we are going to discuss in detail this biliary dyskinesia it is also known as sphincter of odi dysfunction 
Now see the problem. Whenever we are going to take fatty meal, after fatty meal, what? There is increased secretion of bile. And this bile is being secreted. Bile is being ejected out of gallbladder. And this is supposed to enter into duodenum for digestion of fat. But what is the problem? In sphincter of odi dysfunction, in sphincter of odi dysfunction, what is the problem? There is functional blockage of the sphincter. So, what's the problem? There is functional blockage of the sphincter. Sphincter for bile duct as well as sphincter for pancreatic duct. Now, what is the problem? If there is functional blockage inside the CBD, what is the problem? There is increased pressure. So, there is increased pressure inside the CBD as well as in the pancreatic duct. So, there is increased basal pressure. And that's why these patients are going to have biliary colic clear and these patients are going to have acute pancreatitis clear so there is biliary colic or there is acute pancreatitis clear but what is the problem so in this case can you see there is functional blockage of sphincter if we are going to use smooth muscle relaxants like nitrates so, in this case, if we are going to use the nitrates, which are smooth muscle relaxant, it is going to decrease the pressure of sphincter and it is going to relieve the condition temporarily. Clear? Now, the problem. In this case, the problem is that there is increased pressure where? Of the sphincter. So, if you are going to measure the pressure, yes, you can confirm the diagnosis. So, how we are going to measure the pressure? pressure the gold standard investigation for this condition is ERCP plus manometry. Gold standard is we are going to measure the pressure. So it's the ERCP plus manometry of which sphincters obviously biliary and pancreatic sphincters. Second, if we are going for HEDA scan, what is the problem? In HEDA scan, there is delayed biliary transit. So what you will notice that the tracer is not going into duodenum there is delay so on HEDA also you can make the diagnosis on HEDA scan there is delayed biliary transit clear now third problem some patients who are having gallstone disease okay and they have biliary colic for that and we generally perform what lab cholecystectomy if that patient is having sphincter of odi dysfunction, even after cholecystectomy, that patient will be having biliary colic. So, in follow-up, after surgery, patient will be coming to you with biliary colic. And if you are not able to diagnose that what's the cause, you should suspect what? Biliary dyskinesia or sphincter of odi dyskinesia. Clear? So, here you saw that for evaluation, the gold standard is ERCP plus manometry. So, we are using this, clear? We are using HEDA scan. In post-surgery follow-up also, you can make the diagnosis. But generally, ultrasound is not diagnostic. There is a clue on ultrasound. Sometimes you might find dilated CBD on ultrasound, clear? Right? But it is not diagnostic. So, correct answer for this question is D. Now, see what's written in Bailey. First statement, biliary type sphincter of odi dysfunction should be considered and excluded in patients with post cholecystectomy syndrome clear now pancreatic type when there is spasm of pancreatic sphincter or in functional blockage of pancreatic sphincter should be excluded in patients with recurrent acute pancreatitis with unexplained etiology okay now see a careful history is essential ct and MRCP can demonstrate the dilatation of biliary and pancreatic duct. Now see, MRCP with intravenous secretin injection can particularly demonstrate pancreatic duct dilatation due to raised sphincter pressure. So this is the basic problem. There is functional blockage and that is intermittent. Endoscopic ultrasound is also helpful. But here is the Quantitative cholecystography means HEDA scan. On HEDA scan, there is delayed biliary transit. And the question is asked, 
what is the gold standard for diagnosis of sphincter of odi dysfunction and its ERCP with manometry of biliary and pancreatic sphincter. Clear? So, for this question, the correct answer was ultrasound. Now, see this question. ERCP is used in all of the following except, okay? See, ERCP is generally used in cases of recurrent pancreatitis. Why? First, that what is the etiology? And sometimes if there is some obstructive pathology or etiology, ERCP is used to relieve the obstruction. And sometimes it is used to put the stent. Second, in periampullary carcinoma, now see the problem. This is the gallbladder. This is the bile duct. What happens in periampullary carcinoma, especially the ampullary carcinoma? We perform ERCP. Why? To perform or to take the brush biopsy. So generally ERCP is done to take the brush biopsy. Second, sometimes in patients of periampullary car carcinoma, to relieve jaundice, what? We are going to perform ERCP to put the stent. So, for stenting in periampullary carcinoma, we perform ERCP. For taking brush biopsy, we perform ERCP. If a patient is having unexplained jaundice, in that case also, to see what's the etiology and to relieve the jaundice, we perform ERCP. And generally, in patients of pancreatitis, acute biliary pancreatitis, what kind of acute biliary pancreatitis especially the patients who are having cholangitis and the patients who are having cholidocal cyst in which there is cholangitis we perform the ERCP but ERCP in patients of pancreatitis without cholangitis or cholidocal cyst is not having role now see what substance says ERCP early ERCP with or without sphincterotomy was initially advocated to reduce the severity of pancreatitis clear but see however three randomized trials had demonstrated that ERCP is beneficial only for patients with severe acute biliary pancreatitis and that's why routine use of ERCP is not indicated for patients with mild pancreatitis why because generally in these cases the bile duct obstruction is usually transient clear and it resolves within 48 hours after the onset of symptom means first we have to perform it in severe acute biliary pancreatitis second apart from acute biliary pancreatitis severe acute biliary pancreatitis it is indicated for the patients who develop be careful cholangitis and Persistent bile duct obstruction demonstrated by other modalities. Clear? So, see this question again. For this question, ERCP is used in all of the following except pancreatitis without features of cholangitis or cholidocal cyst. Now, see this question. Which of the following is indicative of complete, what? Complete large bowel obstruction. Okay, so let us discuss some important concepts of large bowel obstruction first. You can see this is the large bowel. Clear? Okay, so first question, what's the most common cause of large bowel obstruction? So the most common cause of large bowel obstruction is malignancy. It's the malignancy. Most common cause of small bowel obstruction is adhesions. Okay. In malignancy, which malignancy and what's the most common site? The most common site is what? Rectum followed by sigmoid. Clear? So see, here is the malignancy either in the rectum or in the sigmoid colon. Clear? Now you can see what is the name of this valve? This is IC valve, ileocecal valve. So what is the problem? In majority of large bowel obstruction, you can see that it's a type of closed loop obstruction. Yes, because IC valve is competent. So it's a closed loop obstruction. And because of this, what generally the large bowel obstruction is real emergency because there is no chance of proximal decompression. And that's why vomiting is also not seen. 
but in small ball obstruction what's the problem because bowel is sensitive to stretch in small ball obstruction patient is having multiple episodes of bilious vomiting so in small ball obstruction patient is having colicky pain multiple episodes of bilious vomiting non passage of feces and flatus that's known as cons absolute constipation or obstipation in this case also there is colicky pain in lower abdomen but here there is abdominal distension at the place of bilious vomiting there is abdominal distension and obstipation one one difference clear now see the options high pitched bowel sounds with passage of flatus if there is passage of flatus it is going to rule out the complete obstruction clear second x ray showing dilated loops of intestine yes with plica circularis now this plica circularis this is seen in small intestine these are characteristic feature of small intestine this is not seen in large bowel or large intestine bilious vomiting is again a feature of small bowel obstruction it's generally not seen in large bowel obstruction in large bowel obstruction we saw there is abdominal distension clear and see x ray showing dilated bowel loops with prominent hostations so yes it is seen in large bowel obstruction and generally how to see whether there is complete obstruction there is absence of gas in rectum absence of gas in rectum clear so you must be knowing the differences between small bowel obstruction and large bowel obstruction in small bowel obstruction the loops are placed centrally yes narrow in caliber but in large bowel obstruction it is placed peripherally wider in caliber and there is presence of hostrations how it looks like so here you can see that these are the loops placed peripherally you can easily make out also what that this is ascending colon transverse colon descending colon and you can make out what these are the hostrations clear these are placed peripherally in small bowel loop or in small bowel obstruction the loops are placed centrally narrow in caliber and there is no hostrations in jejunum there is circumferential ring like pattern and that is known as valvuli conventus and in ileum there are no features so ileum is characteristically characterless or featureless so these are the important points related to large bowel obstruction so obviously for this question the correct answer is d now see the literature first mucosa of small bowel is characterized by transverse folds and that is known as plica circularis which is prominent in distal duodenum and jejunum okay one second signs and symptoms of large bowel obstruction depends on the cause and location of obstruction now see rectum and left colon cancers arising from rectum and left colon are more likely to obstruct than those arising from more capacious proximal colon you know this principle also that there is progressive narrowing of lumen in small bowel as well as large bowel that's why what happens duodenum is widest ileum is narrowest similarly there is progressive narrowing of colon also so cecum is widest sigmoid is narrowest so right colon is relatively wider as compared to left colon that's why if malignancy is there bleeding is more common on right side and obstruction is more common on left side regardless of the cause of blockage the clinical manifestations of large bowel obstruction are failure to pass stool and flatus associated with increasing abdominal distension and cramping abdominal pain so generally there is no vomiting now see here large bowel except for cecum shows hostal folds which unlike volvuli conventis are spaced irregularly in volvuli conventis there is regularly spaced ring like pattern so circumferential ring like pattern it is seen in jejunum do not cross the whole diameter of bowel and do not have indentations placed opposite one another clear so for this question it's clear that correct answer is d x ray showing dilated bowel loops with prominent 
frustrations. Now see this question. 65 years old male, okay, presented to emergency with abdominal pain for 6 hours duration. On examination, how much is the blood pressure? Can you see? 90 by 50. How much is the respiratory rate? Yes, 24 per minute. It means this patient is having hypotension. This patient is having increased respiratory rate. Saturation, see the saturation. Saturation is hardly 92%. So, 92% is the oxygen saturation. Okay. Now, see, abdominal x-ray showed extra luminal air in abdomen. So, presence of extra luminal air, hypotension, low saturation, all these favors the diagnosis of perforation peritonitis. So, this patient is having perforation peritonitis clear and what's the problem in this case because of this perforation the intraluminal content is going to collect in the peritoneal cavity and after that what there is third space loss fluid is also collected into the peritoneal cavity and because of this third space loss when patients are coming to us generally they have what hypotension clear so what happens even before even before sending these patients for investigations, in these cases, first on the basis of suspicion only, clinical findings, we are going to resuscitate the patients. So, we give IV fluids, we give IV antibiotics, we insert Ryle's tube, we insert Foley's catheterization and whenever the urine output is 1 ml per minute, means patient is resuscitated, there is adequate tissue perfusion, we are sending the patients for investigation. Clear? So, first we resuscitate the patient and then only we take these patients for surgery. So, see, which of the following must be done before shifting the patient to OT? Intubate the patient, not required because even if you are going to resuscitate the patient, correct the diselectrolytemia, patient will improve. Initial IV access of choice is central venous catheter, no. We insert green cannula, two green cannula clear for resuscitation. So, CVP line insertion or central line insertion is not mandatory. Confirm the diagnosis with CT. No. Presence of extra luminal air means the gas under diaphragm is diagnostic. So, no, no need for CT because the patient is unstable. Infusion of 2 to 3 liters of crystalloids. Yes, we have to resuscitate the patient and correct the diselectrolytemia. So, correct answer for this question is D. Now see what is written in Bailey and what literature says. So management of peritonitis. First can you see correction of fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Then insertion of nasogastric drainage tube and urinary catheter. Broad spectrum antibiotic, analgesia and vital system support. And the surgical treatment of cause when appropriate. So first resuscitation and then surgical treatment remove or divert the cause peritoneal lavage plus minus drainage so it's very important for the patients of perforation peritonitis that we should go for the correction of fluid loss and circulating volume because these patients are frequently hypovolemic with electrolyte disturbances here we have to restore the plasma volume so plasma volume should be restored and ongoing losses corrected clear so, in this question, we should go for infusion of 2 to 3 liters of crystalloids. Now, see this question. A male patient is diagnosed with carcinoma colon. Okay. Which of the following is correct sequence of gene mutation? So, actually speaking, if you see the options given, this question is related to Fearon Vogelstein. Fearon Vogelstein. Adenoma carcinoma multi step model. Adenoma carcinoma multi step model. Clear? This question is asked in medicine also, surgery also, pathology also. So, see what is this? Fearon Vogelstein adenoma carcinoma multi step model. So, in this case, initially you can see there is normal colonic epithelium and there is which mutation? APC gene mutation. Because of this APC gene mutation, you can see there is dysplastic aberrant crypt foci. So, what happens? Tumor initiation. There is tumor initiation. 
then there is formation of early adenoma and then there is KRAS mutation and because of this early adenoma is converted or it is converted into intermediate adenoma then there is DCC mutation DCC full form deleted in colorectal cancer it's deleted in colorectal cancer and because of this there is formation of late adenoma and there is p53 mutation and then there is carcinoma so this is adenoma carcinoma multi-step model and the name is fearon vogelstein so what is the sequence first apc gene then kras then dcc and then p53 clear so it is apc gene followed by kras followed by dcc followed by p53 can you predict who is the next Bollywood star? Most probably, Akshay Kumar is going to be the next Bollywood superstar. Clear? So, how to remember? AKDP, Akshay Kumar's DP. So, the sequence is AKDP. Clear? So, it is APC followed by KRS followed by DCC followed by P53. So, obviously, what is the correct answer? APC followed by KRS, DCC, P53. So, this is in relation to Fearon Vogelstein adenoma carcinoma multi step model. So, correct answer is B. Now, see this question mesh used for hernioplasty should be. Before discussing que this question, let me tell you similar questions were asked previously in NEET and they asked about lightweight and heavyweight meshes. So, what should be the weight of lightweight meshes? The weight should be less than. 40 grams per meter square and what should be the weight of heavy weight meshes in heavy weight meshes the weight is more than 80 grams per meter square simple concept now it's very easy to understand see suppose this is a mesh okay a and b both of these are having almost similar area now see in the meshes there is a large pore mesh large pore and there is a small pore mesh okay what is the meaning see if you see the first one in the first one these are the strings or threads and in the second one can you see these are the threads clear so, if you see the weaving pattern, yes, it's like this. So, in the first one or A, you can see the size of pore is large. So, obviously, it's large pore. And in second, the size of pore is small. So, obviously, it's the small pore. Small pore. This one is large pore. Okay. Simple. So, generally, question, the large pore meshes are lightweight or heavyweight? So, obviously, the large pore meshes are lightweight. So, generally, large pore meshes are lightweight meshes. Clear? So, why this lightweight large pore meshes are preferred? Why? Because there is ingrowth of tissue. So, there is better tissue. So, there is better tissue integration and there is less, less shrinkage. So, that's why lightweight large pore meshes are preferred in hernia surgery clear so see the mesh used for hernioplasty should be heavyweight large pore no lightweight small pore no heavyweight small pore no is the lightweight large pore now see what's written in the belly so first question which is asked related to mesh meshes can shrink by up to 50 percent so first Meshes can shrink how much? This is first question up to 50%. Potential question. And in occasional cases even more. Meshes with thinner strands and larger spaces between them. Lightweight can you see? Large pore meshes are preferred because they have better tissue integration. Less shrinkage. More flexibility and improved comfort. So, for hernia surgery, which mesh is preferred? Lightweight, large pore. Lightweight, large pore. Clear? So, lightweight, large pore meshes are preferred. After that, 
the term light medium and heavy are not precisely defined but meshes less than 40 grams per meter square are lightweight and more than 80 grams per meter square are heavy so the second question which is asked lightweight meshes less than 40 gram per meter square and heavy weight meshes more than 80 grams per meter square okay after that third suppose this is the defect and we are using the mesh so if there is a defect and we are using the mesh generally how much overlapping of margins should be there so there should be at least 2 to 5 centimeter of overlapping of margin so we should cover at least defect with 2 to 5 centimeter of margin all around the defect so the margin all around the defect should be covered minimum 2 centimeter and maximum 5 centimeter so the potential questions are how much mesh can shrink up to 50 percent light weight is less than 40 gram per meter square heavy weight weight is more than 80 grams per meter square and how much overlap of defect should be there at least 2 to 5 centimeter around the defect this is a new question see prostate needle biopsy by single core shows acinar adenocarcinoma so there is acinar adenocarcinoma predominant poorly formed glands in cribriform pattern followed by crowded but separated glands and a minor component of single cell infiltration so see the findings important findings first predominant poorly formed glands okay and which pattern in cribriform pattern cribriform pattern okay so let's first see the gleason grading for prostate we follow gleason grading so let's see the gleason grading and then we can easily crack the question now see the new grading system so if you see the grade one in this only individual discrete and well formed glands are there so here well formed glands were not there second in grade two predominantly well formed glands and lesser component of poorly formed fused or cribby form glands now see the grade 3 can you see predominantly poorly formed fused or cribby form glands with a lesser component of well formed glands so in this picture also so in the question also what there was predominantly poorly formed gland and cribby form gland so correct answer is grade 3 by the way see what happens in grade 4 only poorly formed fused cribriform glands be careful only poorly formed fused cribriform glands are predominantly well formed glands with a lesser component lacking or predominantly lacking glands with a lesser component of well formed glands and what happens in grade 5 grade 5 lacks gland formation or with necrosis with or without poorly formed fused or cribri form gland so according to this description what fits for our answer it's the grade 3 so you saw in grade 3 predominantly poorly formed fused cribri form gland with a lesser component or well formed gland so correct answer for this question is b and that is what grade 3 now see this question a 23 years old male was burnt with bursting of stove there is singeing of hair in his face and burns covered the chest on both sides and front of both upper arms calculate the percentage of burns so you can easily calculate it and you have to apply the rule of nine so here let's calculate since face is involved means this head and neck part so it's nine percent both front and back after that the front of can you see the front of both upper arms so if only front of both upper arms are involved clear so how much four and half 
फोर एंड हाफ ऑन ईच साइड सो टोटल नाइन परसेंट ऑफ बोथ ऑफ दीज आर्म्स आफ्टर दैट बर्न्स कवर्ड द चेस्ट ऑन बोथ साइड्स क्लियर सो एटीन परसेंट इज फ्रंट ऑफ चेस्ट एंड एबडोम एंड एटीन परसेंट इज फॉर द बैक सो फॉर चेस्ट ओनली इट्स नाइन परसेंट सो हाउ मच इज टोटल दिस इज फॉर फेस मीन्स हेड एंड नेक दिस इज फॉर बोथ आर्म्स फ्रंट साइड एंड दिस इज फॉर चेस्ट बोथ साइड्स सो टोटल इज नाइन प्लस नाइन प्लस नाइन सो इट्स ट्वेंटी सेवन परसेंट सो हि द टोटल बर्न सर्फेस एरिया इन्वॉल्व इज ट्वेंटी सेवन परसेंट सो करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस क्वेश्चन इज सी नो सी ऑलमोस्ट एवरी इयर देर इज वन क्वेश्चन रिलेटेड टू पैरोटिड सर्जरी और कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ पैरोटिड सर्जरी ओके सो सी अ पेशेंट आफ्टर पैरोटिड सर्जरी ऑन अवेकनिंग नोटिस्ड lower lip paralysis so there is lower lip paralysis after parotid surgery which of the following is most likely injured okay so you must be knowing that there are five branches of facial nerve in relation to this parotid gland so first have a look of those five branches and anatomy and then we will discuss the question so questions are asked what are the five branches in relation to the parotid gland so first is this is temporal branch of facial nerve then there is जाइगोमेटिक ब्रांच बक्कल ब्रांच मार्जिनल मैंडिबुलर ब्रांच एंड फिफ्थ इज सर्वाइकल ब्रांच ओके नाउ सी दिस इज द लोअर लिप सो इफ यू सी द लोअर लिप एंड यू कैन सी विच ब्रांच इज सप्लाइंग द लोअर लिप रीजन सो जनरली द मसल्स ऑफ दिस लोअर लिप आर मेनली सप्लाइड बाई विच वन दिस मार्जिनल मैंडिबुलर ब्रांच मसल्स ऑफ द लोअर लिप राइट चिन एंड फिलामेंट्स communicate with mental nerve okay now see this which is mentioned in the grays facial nerve is routinely isolated as a part of superficial parotidectomy operation okay typically in the treatment of parotid tumors when that part of gland lying superficial to the plane of facial nerve is removed along with the tumor now see although this can affect all branches of the facial nerve but the weakness is often confined to the territory invaded by marginal mandibular nerve so the weakness is often confined to the territory innervated by the marginal mandibular branch clear and which is most likely to be stretched during surgical intervention and manifested by weakness of lower lip on the affected side clear so important points most likely involvement of which branch the marginal mandibular branch and manifested as weakness of lower lip on the affected side clear so answer is clear that in this question what is the correct answer is the marginal mandibular nerve or mandibular branch so see the question again a patient after parotid surgery on awakening noticed lower lip paralysis which of the following is most likely injured nerve and it's the mandibular branch of facial nerve so it's an easy question and this question was asked many times what is the full form of fast or fast stands for so it is focused assessment with sonography for trauma focused assessment with sonography for trauma so correct answer here appears focused assessment sonograph of trauma so correct answer for this is b since the next question is also in relation to fast let's first discuss fast in detail so this is focused assessment with sonography for trauma so generally in fast we are going to assess four p's so what are these four p's pericardial sac perihepatic region perisplenic region and pelvis okay and for four p's how many minutes are required four minutes so what you are supposed to remember that for four p's it is done within four minutes so generally it is done within 2 to 4 minutes clear now question is asked what is the first investigation done in patients of blunt trauma abdomen whether patient is stable or unstable first investigation done in patients of blunt trauma abdomen is what fast now what in fast only 4 p's are assessed but if you are going to extend it to 
right thoracic as well as left thoracic region this is known as e fast e fast means extended fast after that in which sequence you are going to perform the fast so first for pericardial so question is asked that in which sequence you are going to perform the fast so first is for pericardial sac after that for perihepatic region after that for perisplenic region and after that it is performed for pelvis after that the question is asked for pericardial sac which view is used so for pericardial sac there is sub xiphoid transverse view for perihepatic region which view is there there is right upper quadrant longitudinal view for perisplenic region it's left upper quadrant longitudinal view and if you see the pelvis for pelvis we have suprapubic longitudinal and transverse view so how many views in fast four see now we are going to extend it to visualize the right thoracic and left thoracic region so in fast there are four views but in e fast how many views in e fast there are six views clear this e fast was asked many times in aims and the question was on e fast in pneumothorax which sign is seen so in pneumothorax on e fast there is stratosphere sign also known as barcode sign so there is stratosphere sign and or barcode sign clear so what you can easily assess the hematoma or collection of fluid in pericardiac region perihepatic perisplenic and pelvic region but what is the biggest problem of ultrasound means the fast that it is difficult to assess the retroperitoneum or it is difficult to assess the retroperitoneal hematoma so see this question in fast which of the following site cannot be evaluated so we can evaluate the pericardial fluid we can evaluate the renal hematoma we can evaluate the liver injury clear but what retroperitoneal hemorrhage it is very difficult to assess now see what's written in bailey utilization of e fast detects free fluid in abdomen or pericardium clear not reliably detect less than 100 ml of free blood so this is also a question at least how much blood should be there 100 ml does not directly identify injury to hollow viscous cannot reliably exclude injury in penetrating trauma may need repeating or supplementing with other investigations that's why if the patient is stable and fast is positive we have to confirm the diagnosis with cct and see here this is the question it is unreliable for the assessment of retroperitoneum it is fast is unreliable for the assessment of retroperitoneum clear so for this question the correct answer is b that retroperitoneal hemorrhage cannot be evaluated with fast now see this question which of the following statement is true about retroperitoneal hematoma occurring after trauma retroperitoneal hematoma related questions were asked many times in aims they asked what are the various zones clear so before discussing the options we should first discuss what are the various zones and how we are going to manage the injuries of those various zones so now see the zone this is zone 1 and this zone 1 is central this is central this is the zone 2 and this zone 2 is lateral it's lateral this is zone 3 this whole region and this one is what pelvic and generally it's not given in the books in certain journals it's given there is zone 4 also and this zone 4 was asked in aims and what is this zone 4 it include portal and retrohepatic area clear now see the extent of zone 1 if you see the extent it extend from esophageal hiatus to sacral promontory so if you see here what is included in zone 1 in zone 1 we are going to include what abdominal aorta can you see after that what inferior vena cava so this part inferior vena cava and their proximal branches means proximal branches of aorta and the tributaries of ivc clear 
If you see this zone 2, the extent of zone 2, the lateral diaphragm from this lateral diaphragm to the iliac crest and what is included in zone 2, distal renal arteries and vein means it is in relation to kidney. So zone 2 is in relation to kidney, mainly the vessels, the renal artery and veins and which part? Distal part. Now see, in zone 3 here, it is the retrosperitoneal space of pelvic bowl and here we are going to include iliac artery and iliac vein. And we discussed that in zone 4, we are going to include the portal and retrohepatic area. Now see what is written in subistin related to the management of retroperitoneal hematoma. So see zone 1 hematoma require exploration. Why? Because these are frequently involving aorta, proximal visceral vessels or inferior vena cava. Clear? Now see injuries to retrohepatic vena cava are best served by not exposing the content, low pressure injury and gently packing the surrounding area. Now see the zone 2. A hematoma in the re region of zone, zone 2 predominantly contains kidneys. And be careful, generally we should not explore. So here, should be explored only if it appears that hematoma is expanding and continuing to lose blood. Clear? And what about zone 3? Hematoma in zone 3 is secondary to pelvic fracture bleeding. Should not be explored unless exsanguinating hemorrhage is obvious. So now see, we are basically bothered about zone 2. In zone 2, usually we are not going to explore the hematoma. But see, during laparotomy, penetrating trauma to the retroperitoneum in the vicinity of kidney should be explored. Why? To ensure hemostasis. Clear? But we have to assess for urine leak also. Clear? So if you see the management of retroperitoneal zones, this is for zone 1. Clear? So central hematoma should always be explored with proximal and distal vascular control. This is for zone 2 which is lateral hematoma, usually renal in origin and can be managed non-operatively sometimes with angioembolization until and unless there is penetrating trauma and exsanguinating hemorrhage is going on. What about zone 3 or pelvic hematoma? In zone 3 or pelvic hematoma, these are difficult to control. So generally, we are going to manage it by packing and angioembolization. In the option, there is one option related to Metox Maneuver. So, see what we are going to do in Metox Maneuver. So, what is the other name of this Metox Maneuver? It is also known as Left Medial Visceral Rotation. Okay. Now, see, this is the midline. So, what we are going to do, you can see that this is the left colon, this is the left kidney, this is the spleen and pancreas. Clear? So, you can see left kidney, left colon, spleen and pancreas. These left-sided viscera is brought to the midline. And that's why what's the name? Left-sided medial visceral rotation. After this metox maneuver, which part is exposed? Generally, you are going to see what? Abdominal aorta. Clear? What else? The celiac axis, superior mesenteric artery clear and this part this is the renal artery which part proximal renal artery clear so it is going to expose what aorta celiac axis superior mesentic artery which aorta abdominal aorta and the proximal part of renal artery clear and generally it is recommended for drainage of central supra mesocolic hematoma clear so you have basic idea about zones Metox maneuver and management. Now let's discuss the options. So zone 2 means lateral hematoma, penetrating injuries hematoma, surgical exploration should be done always. Yes, if there is penetrating injury, we have to go for surgical exploration. Otherwise, it is generally managed by angioembolization, 
Metox's maneuver to explore aorta involves mobilization of ascending colon to right. No, ascending colon is always already on the right side. The Metox maneuver is left medial visceral rotation. So we discussed left colon, cleft kidney, pancreas and spleen is brought to the midline. So this option is incorrect. Penetrating trauma in the pelvic region should be explored. No, generally it should not be explored. Clear? Initially we are going to manage it by angioembolization or by packing. In zone 1, injured vessels embolization is done. In zone 1, you saw that major vessels aorta and vena cava are located. And if there is injury of these structures, we have to go for what? Surgical intervention with proximal and distal control. So, embolization is generally not done. So, correct answer for this question is A. That in zone 2, specifically in cases of penetrating injury or exsanguinetic hemorrhage, we should go for surgical exploration. So, correct answer for this question is A. Now, see this question. A 38 years old female was brain dead. She signed for organ donation previously. Family members also accepted. Which of the following patient is ideal recipient? So, this female patient who is a brain dead, she is going for organ donation. So, what is the ideal recipient? Now, see the first option. 70 years old female on dialysis for chronic renal failure. Obviously not because she is having very limited life expectancy. See what's written in Bailey. The age of patient with end stage renal failure accepted for dialysis has risen over the last two decades and in the UK mean age of patient starting dialysis is around 70 years. There is no absolute upper age limit to renal transplantation but inevitably older patients aged more than 65 years are less likely to less likely to be considered suitable candidates. Why? Because they have cardiopulmonary disorders, other comorbidities. So obviously we should not go for a second 50 years chronic alcoholic patient with irreversible liver damage. See if a patient is chronic alcoholic and there is active alcohol abuse that's an absolute contraindication for liver transplantation. See the contraindications of liver transplantation. So here you can see that active alcohol abuse is an absolute contraindication for liver transplantation and if you see if there is ongoing tobacco use or illegal drug use then also it's a contraindication. So here, in this case also, we will not go for transplantation. Now see, 14 years old boy with multi-organ failure. And if a patient is having multi-organ failure, obviously it's difficult to save the patient by organ transplantations, not the good recipient. And see, fourth, 35 years old female with renal failure. So if a female is young, 35 years old, and there is renal failure obviously we will go for it so correct answer for this question is d 35 years old female with renal failure now see this question a similar question was asked long back now see calculate the calories from tpn containing 100 grams of dextrose 30 grams of amino acids and 40 grams of lipids okay so it's very easy to calculate so this table is from subiston so from dextrose how much calories we are getting per gram 3.4 so for 100 grams of dextrose 100 into 3.4 so it's 340 so from dextrose you are getting 340 calories from amino acids how much 4 kilocalorie per gram so it's 4 into 30 so it is 120 and from fat or from lipids how much it's 10 so it's 10 into 40 so it's 400 so how much it's 340 120 400 so it's 860 so it is 860 so how much is the calorie provided by 100 grams of dextrose 30 grams of amino acids and 40 grams of lipids it's the 860 so you have to remember the values that from 1 gram of dextrose how much calorie 
from amino acids 4 and from lipids it's 10 so correct answer for this question is d now see this question similar questions were asked in aims many times so a 26 years old male patient with rta complicated with pelvic fracture has been resuscitated with blood transfusion so pelvic fracture patient history of blood transfusion he was febrile okay hypotensive so low bp dyspneic and oliguric so there is decreased urine output be careful cvp was normal it means the hydration status seems to be adequate clear now started bleeding from nasogastric tube and from iv sites so what you are noticing that patient is having bleeding from nasogastric and iv sites it means some kind of hemolysis is going on and some kind of hemolytic reaction occurred now see let's rule out in fat embolism generally there is similar history but what happens there is petechial rash and how we are going to diagnose this fat embolism syndrome with GERS criteria see the GERS criteria so GERS criteria for fat embolism syndrome there should be at least one major criteria that include petechial rash respiratory insufficiency cerebral involvement in this question there is no petechial rash no cerebral involvement then four necessary for diagnosis what minor criteria so what this retinal change these are the clues which are given in the exam fat macroglobinemia so generally in exam you are going to find what petechial rash retinal changes in which you can find fat or petechi and fat macroglobinemia so these are absent it means this patient is not having fat embolism now see in hemorrhagic shock generally cvp is low and if patient is going to be resuscitated it might becomes normal but what is the problem there is no bleeding from nasogastric tube or from iv sites so this is also ruled out in acute adrenal insufficiency also bleeding doesn't occur so you are left with only one option and that is transfusion reaction now see the problem whenever there is mismatch blood transfusion there is acute hemolytic reaction because of abo incompatibility there is acute hemolytic reaction and this can lead to bleeding complement mediated hemolysis that can lead to bleeding and this can also lead to multi-organ failure so see the complications transfusion reactions okay so if antibodies present in the recipient serum are incompatible with donor cells transfusion reaction will result and the most severe is which one abo incompatibility there is what kind of reaction acute hemolytic reaction so what happens there is fatal complement mediated intravascular hemolysis and multiple organ failure clear after that this there was a similar question in aims image based question this is the transfusion set and in the transfusion set what was the question this filter was marked and it was asked what's the name of this filter so this is leukocyte depletion filter clear what is the problem see there are febrile transfusion reactions and these are generally non-hemolytic caused by graft versus host response from leukocytes in transfused component so if this filter is used this filter is going to filter the leukocytes and with this form of filter used what the transfusion reaction is rare with leukodepleted blood clear so generally if a patient is having febrile transfusion reaction what are the symptoms you are going to see patient might be having fever chills and rigor clear so this question in this question it's a clear cut case of mismatched blood transfusion and because of that mismatched blood transfusion patient is having what acute hemolytic reaction that's why there is bleeding from orifices bleeding from nasogastric site and iv site so correct answer for this question is b now see this question which of the following is not the complication of massive transfusion okay if you see bailey in bailey all these are mentioned that all these are the complications and we can see all these complications okay but which one is rarest have a look in cases of massive transfusion there can be fluid overload hypothermia 
and impaired oxygen delivery capacity of hemoglobin why because over a period of time in the stored blood there is decrease 2 3 dpg now see the electrolyte related problems patient is having hyperkalemia hypocalcemia hypomagnesemia metabolic alkalosis and metabolic acidosis which is rare these are the abnormalities we can have both hyperkalemia as well as hypokalemia but hypokalemia is rarely seen so what's the cause of hyperkalemia you can see after massive blood transfusion the potassium is being liberated from accumulated blood during blood preservation clear but sometimes sometimes patient is going to develop hypokalemia so why patient is going to develop hypokalemia because citrate is metabolized to bicarbonate and because of this patient is having what metabolic alkalosis here and because of this metabolic alkalosis what happens patient is going to have hypokalemia one second transfused rbcs sometimes they take the potassium so if they take some potassium it leads to what hypokalemia so if you see the question all complications can be seen but hypokalemia is rare out of these hypokalemia is rare so correct answer for this question is c now say this question generally they ask one instrument almost every year so what is the name of given instrument this is perkins retractor okay what are the various retractors mastoid jaws and doins how they look like now first see the mastoid retractor this is wittlener's mastoid retractor okay you can see the prongs on both side here one side is solid or flat clear so this one is perkins this is mastoid retractor jaws thyroid retractor is a self retaining retractor which is used for raising the skin flaps and it is self retaining so generally it is used during thyroid surgery and you have seen doins retractor it is used in gynecological operations especially pelvic surgeries so this one is doins retractor used in pelvic surgeries so you might have seen this in gyneotic and this one is jaws self retaining thyroid retractor jaws self retaining thyroid retractor here you can see these two are whenever we are going to raise the skin flap these two are attached and with this what happens you are going to increase the distance between the flaps so these are the instruments which are important so we were expecting lots of questions related to covid and they asked so see all of the following are measures used against covid 19 except so if you have seen the ad amita bachchan is explaining everything so by that also you can crack this question what we have to wash our hands we have to use the face mask and for how much duration generally at least 20 seconds and we are using the hand sanitizers and how much should be the alcohol content means ethanol content at least 70% so all these three are the measures so generally 1% glutaral dehyde is not used 2% glutaral dehyde is used for sterilization of endoscope that is a question so you have seen sidex for certain instruments we are using 2% glutaral dehyde but this is not a measure for what covid 19 clear so correct answer for this question is a by the way see how we are going to prevent covid 19 and important points related to this so for covid 19 prevention avoid close contact with the people who are sick clear avoid touching your eyes nose and mouth with unwashed hands and at least we should wash hands for 20 seconds and we should use hand sanitizer clear at least 60% alcohol if soap and water are not available this is for individuals who are not infected and generally alcohol solutions with at least 70% of alcohol is used so a sick person should prevent spreading the respiratory illness to others how stay home wear a face mask cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue and discard this clean and disinfect frequently touched object and surfaces generally door handles tables gates with diluted bleach or alcohol solutions with at least 70% of alcohol so these were the questions of aim surgery asked in june 2020 exam relatively the surgery paper was easier as compared to previous years 
सो दिस इज ऑल अबाउट द सर्जरी क्वेश्चन गुड लक